Today I am completing a, a series on biblical leadership, and I hope you have been enjoying it. But more than that, I hope you've been applying it because I speak to you as leaders. And I'll tell you what, I believe that you have influence for the kingdom of God beyond what you know, and that opportunities will be there for you even in the coming days where you will be ready. You will be ready in the midst of a conversation to guide things towards a direction whereby the person you're talking to knows that God loves them, knows that God comforts them, knows that God has a plan for their lives. So in 1 Timothy, in the fourth chapter, in the 16th verse, the Bible says, watch your life. Let me say it again. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I want to give you a little bit of background on that, and that is that the Apostle Paul is considered to be the father in the faith to Timothy. It is believed that Paul brought Timothy to Christ, knew Timothy's mother, also knew Timothy's grandmother, and speaks of their faith, which is now in him. He's speaking of generations that he likely was the very one to bring faith into their lives. He was a leader. He's a leader. And he says to Timothy, watch your life. and Also, watch your doctrine closely. Now, what is meant by that is that Timothy is a pastor. He's, he has the gift of an evangelist upon him. And Paul says, stoke the fire of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Stoke the fire of what God is doing inside of you. And as we do that in our lives, we stoke the fire of Holy Spirit activity. We're not meant simply to attend church. We're meant to be the church, amen? We're meant to be the church. And so I find it fascinating here that the statement is there by Paul that Timothy should watch his life and his doctrine. Because that doctrine is going to bring people to Jesus. But if he doesn't watch his life and that he's strong to run this race in such a way as to win, he won't be able to bring people to Jesus all the way through a lifetime. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Dr. Robert Clinton, who is a foremost authority on biblical leadership, and I love his material, studied him greatly in my doctoral courses. Dr. Clinton did a study of 1,300 leaders, okay, 1,300 leaders. That's a large study that he's doing there. But they weren't all leaders who were alive. He studied at least 50 leaders out of the Bible, Old and New Testament. He studied church leaders out of church history. He studied leaders that are contemporary uh, Christian leaders as well. And he came to some conclusions within it, and the finding that was shocking to people when he brought this out, was that only one in three leaders finish well. I want you to get that inside of you. Only one in three leaders were found to have finished well. Now, we could go deeper into that study, and I'm just kind of glancing uh, at it or or skipping it uh, over rather quickly, but if we look at it, We consider in the Old Testament, Daniel was a leader that finished well. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul was a leader who finished well. We go to the Old Testament, we see David. He kind of limped across the finish line, but he made it. There were some things that were there that were not of a sort, whereby somebody is finishing in the way that Daniel finished there. But he finished uh, well in the end, uh, but but he had his troubles. And we can certainly see individuals that did not finish well. We have uh, in the Old Testament, I think of King Saul, he didn't finish well. And I think in the New Testament of one that didn't finish well, does the name come to mind? Judas didn't finish well. We could look at others as well if we were studying various ones. But it gets the cross, across the idea that it's not given to us that we're going to finish well. We need to be proactive and determined and intentional. I spoke to our dream team yesterday, and we have a great dream team, and uh, they're all the ones who serve to make this church possible. And I want to go ahead and show our love for them right now. Would you? And and, And again, 
You can be a part of the dream team and the ushers and the greeters and, and, and downstairs where so much is happening uh, on our foundational level down there. And so there are six characteristics of those who finish well. Are you ready for this? Here's the characteristics according to Dr. Clinton's study. Number one, they had over and over again a lifetime perspective, okay? A lifetime perspective. I remember when I was in college, I was determined, even though I wasn't married yet, I was determined that when I would marry, that I would have a marriage whereby if God would give us children and they would grow into adulthood and they would get married, that I would be right next to my wife on the same pew, very much in love with her, whereby our children would see this and it would be a role model for them. Now, we've had one wedding take place, and that's our middle daughter, Taylor, who got married to Luke, who's uh, here right now, and, and we couldn't ask for a better son-in-law than Luke. He's just totally a part of our family, 100%, and so proud of him. And you know what? That's already taken place once for us. Now, I'm saying, get on, get on the ball over here, Sydney, and <laughs> Aubrey, what's the delay in everything that we're doing here? But you know, I would have a, I, I had this imagery in my mind that, that okay, focus in. <laughs> and I had this imagery in my mind that there would be a reunion, family reunion. I'd be the patriarch, Lisa would be the matriarch. We're looking around and we're seeing our children and they're enjoying themselves in a park. And I see our grandchildren, maybe there are great grandchildren there. And we're seeing ones over and over again as they're playing. We're thinking they're serving the Lord and they're faithful to God. That is intentional. That is a focus and a determined plan before we get there. And I can tell you that if you would say, oh, I've already messed up in the plan. I can't be my story. Well, put one good decision on top of another good decision on top of another good decision, and know that God's grace is greater than anything that we've been through. We can know that. But I know that the day will come where I will die, and there will be a service, and I want for that service to be such that people say, he ran the race, and he won. He ran the race, and he won. It's intentional. I've said it before me. The second thing that we see, and I encourage you guys to do the same, of the six characteristics of those who finish well, is that there were times of renewal in those who have finished well. And this is important. In fact, we looked at this years back to say we need to build a culture at Capital Life Church where we have self-care, where we have the ability to breathe in deeply and rest at moments. The Sabbath is a part of scripture were to have those moments where we're able not only to work and be excellent in the work that we do, yes, we work hard, but there are moments in which we need to be able to be refreshed and renewed without guilt. And so we have set up a culture where whereby we can do that. Otherwise, you know how it is at your job. It's a constant thing of work, work, work. Now you have this to-do list and that to-do list. I've often thought, why don't we do have done lists and feel great about it? We've always got a to-do list, which means you're never done. You're constantly going to the next thing. And even if you check some things off, watch the brand new things come in on Monday for you to take care of. We need times of renewal and refreshing. And then we see that of those that finished well, that they had the spiritual disciplines in their lives. And we've been talking a little bit now, and then I hear people talk about spiritual disciplines, and above all else is going to be having the grace uh, emphasis and theme and be going through some of the spiritual disciplines along with other things that they'll be looking at. And I think that that is an incredible place to be to focus in on the disciplines of the faith. There's a person by the name of Richard Foster, and he wrote a book celebration of discipline. It has been around for decades. It has got to be like in the top 100 bestsellers of all time because every believer ought to have uh, this book in their library. 
it draws you back to the disciplines of the faith. Can we think of what the disciplines of the faith are? Anybody know? We have prayer, Bible study, meditating upon God, and uh, serving, witness, stewardship, celebrating. It's in the title. <laughs> and, hey, that's good. That's absolutely there. All of these being the disciplines of the faith. Well, it's vital that we not only know them, it's vital that we live them. And this is what causes us to finish strong. You may feel like finish, I'm just beginning. Or I'm right in the early part of the middle of my race. Listen, the day will come where you will recognize what matters most and you'll be at a place of recognizing that you've either made the decisions that have caused you to live in that way or you haven't. And so spiritual disciplines are so vital. Number four, we see a learning posture. We can easily say, I know all there is to know now on a given subject. I don't need to know any more about it. Now I kind of am just routine and I can coast. God has never made a biblical hero in the scriptures who coasted. I just don't see it. I see always being instant, ready to do the will of God. And so we need a learning posture that we are watching and listening and learning. And when you see ones that have been in the faith for decades, I'll tell you at that moment, there's a deep sense of respect in me when I see that. Because I know that there's not an individual when you get to know their story. And we're going to be going into life stories uh, in the next uh, couple weeks and, and through the month of October to bring out the unique story <clears throat> that God is writing in your life. And we'll be looking at all of that. But I can tell you there's not a life that I know that has been only roses and good times. There have been challenges for each and every one of us. It's what we do in response to that. And so there will be highs, there will be lows. We'll look at all of that and see God narrative in the midst of it. But there is a learning posture that is there. When I'm with somebody who is a saint of the Lord, who's been there for decades in knowing the Lord, I'm always looking to see what I can learn. I'll tell you, it might be the way they pray. It might be the way they talk to individuals. And I've been uh, in that position all my life to not only be where, yes, I've had leadership positions, but I am learning. And we always want to be there. Number five, mentoring, which speaks to learning. And we think of the Apostle Paul who said, follow me as I follow Christ. So he has a focus on the one that he's following. Then he's calling others to follow him. You need someone that you're following. Now, we all ought to have the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul did. But we ought to also have individuals in our lives that just cause us to want to go after God all the more. And we can see that maturity of Christ in them. And then there ought to be ones that we're bringing along. We're helping them to be able to see all that God has created them to be, the plan coming forth of God in their lives. And then the sixth thing in regard to the six characteristics of those who finish well is rather obvious, but it is having a relationship with God, and that that isn't just religion. Now, let me hit that with you, because you'll hear us from time to time say it. It isn't just about religion. You've got all types of religions there, that are out there, and over and over again, there's this sense of what can I do to get God's pleasure, but I'll tell you, we believe in Jesus, and we believe in a gospel of grace, and that grace allows us to know God himself, the one that created. Who are we that God would even know us or think of us? And yet God creates us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in our mother's wombs. And God has a plan for us. So we need that relationship with God of intimacy. The way that you hear from time to time that I'll say that my mother taught me when I was a boy, get alone with God till you know you've met him. Till God's as real to you as the breath that you breathe, as real as you as the heart that, be that beats in your chest, that God is that real to you. So that this isn't about church attendance. Church attendance is because we want to come together with fellow believers and know the word of God and be able to serve one another and love one another and pray together and set forth things that change nations and communities. But we need to know God in the intimacy of relationship on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, as well as Sunday. 
I've oftentimes said it's the icing on the cake when we get to Sunday. It just confirms what God has already been showing you all through the week. Because you have a relationship to God that's all yours. And when you stand before God, although I'd like to be there right next to you, I won't be. And I'll be in heaven, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, I, but I won't be holding your hand during those times, and, and maybe others won't either. I think we stand before God at that moment with the relationship that we know we've had with him. So going back to 1 Timothy again, I want to read it to you again. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So what we see in this, what I see in this, is that the Apostle Paul cares more for Timothy than Timothy's title. He cares for him more than just the fact that he's a pastor and leader. And I appreciate everybody who cares for me as a pastor, but I love to have those who care for me as a person as well and who pray for me in that way. And I want to have a relationship with individuals that's like that, that you care beyond any title, beyond anything that we do, and you care about the person as to who they are as a person. And we see that with the Apostle Paul with Timothy, that he really does care for him in this way and wants him to stoke the fire of the Holy Spirit in his life and wants him to watch his life and watch what he says in his doctrine and all of this. And I think he's watching over him to make sure that the joy isn't stripped out of his life. And I think he's watching over him to make sure that the peace doesn't leave. And we need good friends that can do that. Do you know what the peak age is of laughter? Age four. After that, life comes in. And we begin to lose some of the joy factor after the age of four. That's according to studies. Chuck Swindoll, who's a great pastor off the West Coast and has been so faithful for decades, he said these words. He said, the trouble with success is that the formula is the same as the one for a nervous breakdown. And so here we are succeeding. And I can tell you a lot of people succeed in this area, meaning they give every ounce of who they are. I mean, we're willing to be out on that freeway for an hour to get somewhere and return another hour, two hours every day, how much out of our lives in order to get somewhere to do a job and climb that ladder and show that we're successful. And yet it can cause people to be bankrupt inside in regard to their relationship with God. So there must be, you know, someone who reminds us from time to time amidst the constant pressure that we're more than just about the achievements that we're doing in our lives. In fact, there's a dangerous treadmill that we get on. And there are three things that I'd like to focus on in, this, on this, in regard to this dangerous treadmill. And they are as follows. The idea that I am what I do, that's performance. And many of us get caught in this sense of if I can only perform for God, you know, the tap dance for God, God will then be pleased with me. And, oh, I'm going through a season where I've hit rock bottom and God, I don't even know where he is anymore. I don't know if he loves me anymore. That's not a good theology. Talk about watching over your doctrine and your theology, as the Apostle Paul told Timothy to do. The idea that performance is why God loves us is false. And so we've got to know the truth, right? We've got to know what the Bible has to say about all of this. And we are not, and we've heard this before, but get it inside of you. We are not human doings. We are human beings. We care about that being aspect because there was a Nike years ago did that campaign of image is everything. Image is not everything. And it's important that we recognize that we are not tap dancing for anybody. We want to please the audience of one. Amen? And then the second thing on the dangerous treadmill beyond what I do being who I am is that I am what I have. I am my possessions. And we see people who love to show off their possessions where they live, what kind of car they drive. Don't get me wrong. The older I get, I love the sight of shiny chrome. But it doesn't mean I have to own everyone I see. Listen, we are not our possessions. 
We are not simply what we have in the bank. You can be a POW, prisoner of war, three foot by four foot cell, and you can be one of the greatest heroes for God in that cell. It's not what you own. It's not what you have. Do you know millions and millions of dollars are put into convincing somebody that if you just wear these shoes, you and Michael Jordan are hanging out, you know, or whoever it is today. If you can just own this home, if your car is just this fast, then look at who you are and how you've achieved. And we have misled people by all that type of marketing. Don't buy into it. Know that there are people sitting around in a room trying to figure out how to get you to buy something. <laughs> Telling you that if the name brand isn't on it, I'm not talking about being paupers or anything. I think God blesses. But I believe that there is a, a, a thing that goes way down deep inside. And that is that we need to know that we are not what we possess. And we're not what we do. And the third thing on that treadmill that's dangerous is the image I project is who I am. Now, again, I've touched on this a little bit, but that's pride. And that's the original sin. I shall be like the most high God. No. And Lucifer fell from heaven. So signs of burnout, I want to share these with you. And some of you may be like, yep, <laughs> yep. With each one of these, I say, listen, I have known what it is to have times where I feel like I'm burned out. And the last time where I really felt it was, was a number of years back. We're in a very healthy, wonderful place. Lisa and I were saying to each other, oh, isn't it nice to just be in a healthy place, healthy team, healthy, you know, everything going. But there are moments in life. And I remember that I was sharing with a group of leaders about self-care and burnout. And I went through a list and when I got done with the list, I said, I think I identify with almost every one of these right now. I'll tell you, it was silent in the room. Nobody knew what to say. And afterwards, a couple people said to me, I'll be praying for you. And prayer is powerful and prayer matters. But there are moments in which we need a plan and we need to step in and help somebody who's feeling like they are wiped out, especially where, when they're in the Lord's service, meaning there is so much that is there of walking with people through life in the toughest times of their lives that there must be moments in which you have people around you who will say, listen, we've got it covered. You take a week off and you get where you need to be. So these signs of burnout are, peop are that people become obstacles. Spiritual flatness is a sign of burnout. And would you say that you're spiritually flat at this moment? You could be in burnout. Complaining, irritability are signs of burnout. See, I live with someone who must be in burnout. <laughs> oh, not me. Not me. Withdrawal, sadness can be signs of burnout. Sleep disturbance. I've had people tell me even the last few weeks that they're having trouble getting more than a few hours sleep. Feeling unappreciated. I think uh, everybody feels that at some point. Isolated. Boy, is this an area to isolate you. Loss of enjoyment. And so if you feel that you are facing those things, I think it's important that you know that we care. The church is a place where when you come, we care. We pray for you. Not only do we pray for you, we want you to know we might get a little bit more dogged in how we talk to you. We want you to get some rest. We want that to be without guilt, without shame. There is a culture that must be built. And we have built that culture at Capital Life Church. And that is nobody needs to feel guilty for running this race so fast that when you get exhausted, that you, can, that, that, that you feel like you can't say that, that you're tired. There are moments like that. We all have them. We have had them. And I, I honestly, I'm convinced 
that King David, who wrote the Psalms, greatest king of Israel, the one who took down Goliath, I am convinced King David was burned out over and over and over again. At least two-thirds of the Psalms are burnout. Now, we think of him as a man after God's own heart. All these great exploits of David, but there is burnout that we see in two-thirds of the Psalms, complaints to God, and uh, that by this great man. Let's look at 1 Kings, and we'll look at another great person in the scriptures, and that is Elijah. And in the first verse, going through the eighth verse, the Bible says, now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the, God, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. And boy, I'll tell you, at that moment, Elijah knows she wants to kill him. Third verse, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, said this great prophet of the Lord. Take my life, he says to the Lord. I am no better than my ancestries, uh, ancestors, rather. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, I want to look at this with you just a little bit because what we're seeing here, if you wonder what's, what a spiritual burnout looks like, this is it. You're seeing it. And it comes right after Elijah challenges what our 400 prophets of Baal as to who the true God is. Is it Baal or is it the one true God? Elijah's God. Elijah absolutely has a partnership going on here, and God wipes out the prophets of Baal. Now, at this moment, it's a great victory for God, a great victory for Elijah, and yet, even though Elijah ought to be on a high, he is absolutely in spiritual burnout. Queen Jezebel threatens his life. And Elijah goes to the other side of the desert. And what does he do? He isolates himself. Let me say this about isolation. It was in the list that we looked at a moment ago. When people most need God, because they're going through a crisis, they tend to stop coming to church. They tend to stop connecting with those of the faith. We'll hear at times from people that are regular attenders coming to Capital Life Church and enjoying the things of God at Capital Life Church. Then they go through a difficult time, and we don't see them through that difficult time. Then they come in after a long time later, and they say, oh, what I went through. When we go through crisis is when we most need to be in the house of God and most need one another. And so he's isolated, and he asks God to kill him. Now, we learned in counseling in my days in seminary that you listen to the words that people say when they're with you. Somebody can say, yeah, you know, I'm not having the best day. Or they can say, yeah, I feel like a truck ran over me, went back over me again, and then over me again. Now, one's a bit more dramatic. That may just be personality. But what we're listening for are those who are speaking in terms of there being no light at the end of the tunnel. And we need to be aware if something goes to that level that we need to respond and treat that as to the level that it's at. And here he is. He asked God to kill him. And instantly as a counselor, my ears would perk up at that moment that we need to do triage here. We need to step in. We need to do something and do it now. We need to do this even if the person doesn't want us to do it. We need to help them. 
So God's pres prescription for Elijah's burnout comes through an angel. And I love the story. And of course, we just read it. And the first thing we see is that the angel lets him eat and rest. There is an intentional plan that we see here that the angel is pursuing in order for Elijah to recover his strength. The angel didn't minimize what Elijah was saying. He didn't make light of it. He didn't say, oh, come on, toughen up. He wants him to eat. He wants him to rest. He wants his physical needs to be taken care of. The second thing we see is the angel let him release his frustrations. We need those who will listen to us. Not always having answers to give in the first two minutes because they're so busy. But to listen, to walk with us, to know there may be some ups and downs in this and a bumpy ride before we get this to where we need to be. And when we're talking about someone who can do that for us, we need spiritually mature confidants because people will go to the first person that's near them and want advice that speaks to the level of what we're talking about with burnout. No, you need someone spiritually mature in order to speak into your life at such a moment. Don't just pour your heart out to anybody. You need someone you trust. You need someone you know is godly and will be there with you and stand with you. And I've had those moments where I'll just pull one person that I trust. And that person is the one that I'll let my heart be known in everything that's happening. And it may not be known by anybody other than that person, but that person I trust to listen and be there. So it's not just me carrying that burden. And sometimes that needs to be someone beyond my wife, even though I tell everything to my wife, the depths of where I need to go with some things, I need somebody other than my spouse to do that because I don't want to carry her down in the swirl of what I'm feeling or going through. Now, again, lest anybody say, Pastor, can we gather around you and pray for you because you're hurting right now. We've had these seasons. We're in a wonderful, wonderful season now as to how everything's going. But I can tell you, I know between now and the end of my life, I've got to be ready. There are seasons of ups and downs, and we need these people that we can trust, right? Yes. Third thing, the angel calls him to refocus on God. Our focus matters. What you focus on will develop. So our focus matters. And often we're too focused on our own problems, the ones before us, that's all we can see, that we don't see the mission anymore. We don't know that we're called anymore. And it's so vital that we keep our focus on God, even though other things are urgent and clamoring for our attention. Number four, the angel calls Elijah to resume serving others. Now, I know back in our university days, we would have students come and say, I feel spiritually numb. I don't, I don't sense anything happening in my life. And I'm feeling down and I'm feeling depressed or discouraged or whatever it may be. And, and Lisa and I would have ones, especially when we, did, when we sponsored retreats, because when you go on a retreat, people just really open up more. They're not in as much of a hurry. They know they're on some mountain in Arkansas. They're not going to get somewhere else anytime soon. And they open up and they share. And over and over again, Lisa and I would ask a question and it would be a question that they would not expect. And the question that we would ask is, are you serving anyone right now? Are you touching the life of another? Are you pouring into the life of another? And sometimes the response would be shock. Are you kidding me? Don't you hear what I'm saying? I'm down. This isn't about others. It's about me. I need your focus. But we have found that it is by serving others that all of a sudden the focus we have on ourselves and what we're going through begins to take on a different sense. It's not as important when we're serving another. And we found in our own lives that when we do this, God takes care of the rest. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you, the scriptures say. And so to be refocused on God, to resume serving others, and, um, and stress, the word in Latin, do you know what it means? The word stress, it means 
to be pulled tight. It's an interesting way to state it, to be pulled tight. So let's look at warning signs of strain. They might sound a little bit like what I went through with the last list. But warning signs of strain are the loss of interest in work, difficulty setting boundaries, fatigue, difficulty rebounding, the loss of perspective. When I was a chaplain at Oral Roberts University, I mentioned the students that we so enjoyed being with, and uh, I love that age group. You're talking about pretty much 18 to 22-year-olds, and then you get into the master's programs, and you go into the middle 20s and later 20s, and then you got the one that's staying there for the third or fourth doctorate and is in his 50s. <laughs> and, and they set up a meeting to come in and see me in my office. So on some days that were set up for counseling, I would see one after another, after another, after another. And, and in would come a student and sit down right in front of my desk there in a beautiful building called Christ Chapel where we would hold our, our uh, chapel services and we'd have thousands present. They had to be. It was mandated, but two days a week. So there I was with these students in the office. And I had a little item that I brought back from India when I was there. I like when I'm in other nations uh, of the world to bring back something that represents the country. And when I was in India, I must not have had much money. I got a little tiny soapstone, I think they call it, a soapstone, sandstone, I don't know, but a little stone elephant. And I brought it back and I put it on my desk and most people would never know that it was there. But when I was in the midst of a counseling situation and somebody was sharing with me that they were going through one of the hardest times of their lives, it would be at that moment that I'd pick up this little elephant. I would say, do you see this? Yes. I said, as long as I have this right up here, I, don't, I can look at you. I can look at everything in my office. I can look out the windows of my office at this beautiful campus out there. But what I see mainly is this little elephant because I've got it right here. And I can't see anything outside of the perspective of that being smack dab large in the middle. But when I put it back down, it takes on the perspective that shows its real size. King David said, come magnify the Lord with me. It wasn't because God is small and we've got to make him look bigger. It wasn't the Wizard of Oz thing. Don't look behind the curtain. Come magnify the Lord with me speaks to the fact that we tend to whittle God down to finite size so that God is somewhat like us so that we feel like we know as well as God. Let me tell you, God's wisdom far goes beyond what we know. His resources are far greater. And so getting that little elephant back into perspective, I'd say now look at this in terms of everything else. I want you to know that God is big and he's powerful and he's more than able to take care of you with what you're facing and what you're going through. And I believe that that's true for you today with what you're facing. Please hear me with this. God is so much bigger than any circumstance. I've known of people who have talked like Elijah and have talked about despairing of their own lives, thinking of committing suicide. I've dealt with individuals who have tried to commit suicide, who are right in the, in the midst of the act, dealt with all types of things through the years of people who have gone through quite a bit. I can tell you that ending one's life is a very permanent solution to a very temporary problem. Your God is big. Your God is powerful. We ought not just hunker down and get numb to things and think it's okay. I'm going through a, a season where I've had discouragement all over me. Yes, that's true. I've been depressed. I'll get through it. I've gotten through it in the past. Let's hunker down. Something good's going to happen somewhere down the road. Well, I appreciate your optimism, but I'd like to stand upon the word of God and upon faith. And that is to know that God is for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? And anything that's been spoken over you is a weapon that will not stand. You've got an intercessor that is standing next to the Father, seated next to the Father, standing next to the Father in heaven. His name is Jesus. His lips are moving on your behalf. And when your mom and dad forget to pray for you, when your spouse might forget to pray, if your pastors on any given day forget to pray, I can tell you, 
that Jesus is praying for you. And he's canceling out every attack of the enemy where you are concerned. Those things that are accusations that have come against you, let God be true and every man a liar is what the Bible says. That means that God who has shaped you in your mother's womb, it was a plan for you and it will is not a plan to do you harm, but a plan for good. That that is the truth. You're going to make it through. That word, stress, is more than a word. And we not, ought not carry that upon us to the point where we feel like we're losing the battle. Boy, is God all over you right now. And God loves you. And when his hand rests upon you, he raises you up. That resurrection power, we sang about it a moment ago. The resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of you when you know Christ and raises you in the midst of every circumstance that you can be going through. And it's okay to create reasonable limits. It is. It's all right to say no. You don't have to do it with an attitude. Smile and say no. Can't do it. It's important to focus on matters of the heart over just a sense of performing. The word Sabbath in the Hebrew actually means to cease working, to rest. And there's a reason why the Sabbath was so important in biblical days, yet is getting lost today in the midst of if I just work more hours. If I can just, I can achieve, I can get, to, I can climb. And all the while, God's looking at your heart and saying, all I want to do is spend time with you. All I want to do is invest time in you and pour my spirit into you and refresh you. I encourage you in this season to rediscover God in your story. Next couple of weeks, we'll be going through life stories. I want you to rediscover God in your story. See, I've known God all my life. I want you to rediscover him in this season that you're walking through now so that as you set the sail, you're setting it towards a direction whereby you're going to finish well. So as we talk about leadership, we study leadership, we take notes on leadership, we debate leadership, let's step further than that and let's finish well as leaders because... We served others well, and we pleased God, the audience of one. Stand to your feet, please. I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you that as we complete this series, it's more than just words. God, every time your word is opened up and declared, God, there are miracles that take place. There is strength, and there is restoration, and there is healing, and there is hope. And so, God, we revel in the hope. We splash around in the joy, unspeakable and full of glory. We dance before you with peace that passes even the understanding of anybody around us, much less we ourselves. We don't know why we have the peace in the midst of what we're facing, but that peace is tangible. It's palpable. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for each and every leader hearing my voice that their influence will be used for eternal things over temporal. God, that you will cause people to be near to your heart, to be led by your spirit, to serve others, to submit even the busyness of life to serving in practical ways. God, we love you. And we thank you for the reminder that we're called to finish well, not simply to run and then be seated on the side of the road. God, I pray that each and every person listening to my voice right now will finish well and be determined to do so and get a plan in mind and see that reunion of the family and see those wedding times. Father, thank you for ones that are listening to this you're going to mentor others in this direction. 
God, I pray that each person here today will know where they stand with you. And I ask you to right now, put your hand over your heart. And God, as we place our hands over our hearts, we just declare our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, our need of a Savior who died on the cross and rose from the dead. If you want to have a commitment to Jesus, if you want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt where you stand with God, that Jesus is your Savior, if you were to draw your last breath on this earth, your first breath in eternity, that you know, that you know, that you know, that you'll be with God. Pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, you prayed out loud. Dear Jesus, I repent of my sin. I believe in my heart that you died on the cross for me, that you rose from the dead, that you are my Lord and Savior. I give you my past, my present, my future. And for some of you, you'll pray this prayer. I rededicate my heart to you. Moments of surrender are the most powerful moments that we'll ever know on the face of this earth. All of heaven stands at attention when one individual says, I'm serious about the things of God. I give my life to God. If you prayed that prayer and you're asking Jesus to be your savior, are you rededicating your heart? Just put your hand up in the air and then back down all over this place. Yes, yes. Heavenly Father, continue to be on the move. Thank you for every, each and every person here. Meet every need. We pray against all discouragement and depression. Be gone in Jesus' name. And we love you, God, for giving us joy and peace and good friends and good family. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day.